had this thought before I sure have. If I'm the only person, what can I do? Well, the answer actually might amaze you, and it certainly surprised our guest, Kari. Mm -hmm. When American writer Kari Grady Grossman entered a crowded Cambodian orphanage a few years ago to meet her eight-month-old son, one of her first questions was, how did he get here? The answer inspired her to build a school that now teaches over 500 poor Cambodian children. She tells this story in her book, Bones that float. One person really can make a difference. Look at that smile mm -hmm. on your face. That is amazing. What did you learn about your son that started this all? Well, when we asked the question um, to ourselves, how, how did he get to this orphanage, um, we learned that my son's birth mother uh, came to the orphanage with him. Um, he had two other siblings, and his older sibling was sick, and she needed someone to take care of her son, who was a baby at the time. And she returned three days later, and the oldest one had died. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was malnourished, and she didn't have enough food. And she said, I can't feed him. And she knew someone who worked at this orphanage, so she essentially said, can you take care of him? And uh, left with her um, daughter. And um, that sort of opened our hearts into looking at all the issues of Cambodia today and its poverty and the number of people who don't have education, basic health care yeah, is a staggering number. It and really triggered something in your heart. In fact, you went on to really start a whole big school for children. It started what, like at 50 kids in this one village in Cambodia. Now what? Now, what? Um, now there's 500, over 500 that go. Now what, what made you start this? What did you see there? Well, um, at the time, we wanted to give back because we wanted to give back to this country that had given us our beautiful child. So we got involved with a project that was building schools. Now, seven years ago, rural Cambodia had no schools. So we donated to another organization that had a project to build schools. And we went to this village, and we saw literally a dirt floor hut with a bamboo roof that had, or not bamboo, I'm sorry, thatched roof that had huge holes in it, and the kids were sitting on these logs in the mud floor. So and contrast that to now. What's going on now? That, that oh. mud floor and all that now, what's it like now? Now they have a five-room cement building with a tile roof and solar panels and a computer and a library and a teacher's wow. residence. Wow. And that all started with the adoption of your son. It all started so, with so the adoption of our son. It's you, named after him. When you talk to the kids, what is it they want to learn? What, what, what are their dreams? Well, it was interesting that when we first went on the first visit when they were in their mud hut, um, we asked the kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they just stared at us. They Like the whole idea of growing up and being something was mm -hmm. a foreign concept. So, uh, Is it because they're just focused more on survival at yeah, that point? Yeah, well, how are you going to eat tomorrow? We <laughs> have some video of the kids answering. Take a look at this. When I asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? I got a lot of blank stares. It was a dumb question in a world with no choices. But slowly, the children began to dream. What do you want to be a teacher? He wants to be a teacher. I'll be a doctor. Me also the teacher. She wants to be the teacher. Yes. Oh, I jump to the ground. She wants to be a teacher. She wants to be a teacher. Hey, she wants to be a nurse or doctor. A nurse or doctor. Very good. Saying my only jump to the ground. Yes. She wants to be a doctor. A doctor. Very good. So I guess the biggest question in all this is, how did you raise the money to do it? I mean, a lot of us have these dreams, but it's like, ah, financially, mm. how do you do it? Yeah, I'm not a well-off person. I'm just middle class like everyone. But what I do is um, I bring back goods from Cambodia. That are, Cambodia is known for Ooh. its silk. Wow. And these are hand-woven silk that uh, women do there, and then they sew them into these beautiful silk handbags. That's beautiful. And then um, I do silk scarves as well. And you've written a book about all your efforts, in fact, and you sell these at the book signing. You were telling me that right before I the do. show. Uh -huh. At uh, the book signings, I always have my silk goods, and that's the number one way that we fund the teachers, and the 25% of the book is also. So what can the, our everyday person watching the show, what, what can we do? Because it, sometimes it just seems so overwhelming. You see these children you know, living in these dire conditions. Your heart goes out to them. What, what would you recommend? Because it was just you that did all of this. You started all this. Yes, and you know, I had a connection to Cambodia because of my son, and what I've learned in this process is the relationship matters as much as the money. Mm. So all of us can give of our heart, whether it's across the world or in your neighborhood. Look into your heart. If there's something that really calls to you, make decisions to spend your time there mm -hmm. somehow.
What's the hardest part in all this for you? Sometimes it's overwhelming to run a family and promote a book and <laughs> sell skill, scarves and run, uh, you know, a school on the other side of the world at time. <laughs> you have a great story about a 20-year-old girl, I think, that really just sort of has to warm your heart and makes it all seem worthwhile. Her name is Tao Soka. Um, on this last trip to Cambodia in February, mm -hmm. this community is having a terrible problem with forest destruction and they want it to stop. Um, and so this woman, I told them to write letters and I would help them get them out to the media and nobody wanted to write the letter because they were so afraid of their government. So Tao Soka is 20 years old. She, is the, she was pregnant with her fourth child mm. and she graduated from our school and she was the first one to come forward with a beautifully written, written letter about helping to stop this forest destruction in her community. And all because she learned how to read and, and write. And she learned to read and write at wow. our school. Deborah in our audience with a question. Go ahead, Deborah. Got a question? Deborah? Yeah. What else has happened to other students of yours, you know, this, this heightened activism and the ability to do something about it? Um, can you tell us more about what's, what's been going on in the lives of other alumni? Uh, children who've gone on from the school. Um, well, the school goes to sixth grade. And most kids don't make it all the way to sixth grade. 50% dropout starts in third grade because kids need to work. But the handful who have uh, graduated that far, we now actually have 10 kids going on to secondary school. Wow. There was no secondary school three years ago. Oh, Carly. Um, but one boy in particular, his whole family has supported him to go on to secondary school. He's quite bright. Um, and uh, the other children in his family are not going to school. So, to so one him. person. One person can do it. Proceeds from the book going to support the school. We'll be right back. Thank you. For more information about Kari Grady Grossman's book or school, visit bonesthatfloat.com. Kari will be giving two Seattle presentations September 17th at Ravenna Third Place Books and September 18th at Queen Anne Books.